So welcome. My name's Rob Hurd. I'm the chair and founder of the Older Drivers Forum. I was also in the police for 30 years, 26 of them roads policing officer. So a lot of knowledge to do with that. And as a result of all the things that I dealt with in the police, I set up the Older Drivers Forum, which is about helping and supporting mature motorists to carry on driving safely for longer. And that's what we're hoping today's webinar is going to help you with as well. So today's webinar is all about, are you driving whilst impaired? Now, quite often when we talk about impairment, we're often thinking that's something to do with a drink, drugs or a medical condition. But actually, that's not always the case. So we may drive in an impaired fashion at any time on our lives. And that might be down to things like tiredness, stress, or maybe a distraction, or just because we've become complacent about our driving, which can really be a common thing for many of us. Now, this webinar will look at the factors which may cause us to drive whilst impaired and affect our driving decisions as well. It also offers solutions and ensure that we can keep the risk on the road to a minimum and hopefully lower those chances of being involved in a road traffic collision. So I'm going to introduce you to our presenter today. His name is Graham Millwood. Now, Graham is uh, the senior road safety officer for Hampshire uh, County Council. He's done many of our webinars for us before. Absolutely brilliant speaker, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy his presentation today. So, Graham, over to you. Thanks, Rob. I have a, a lot to live up to, I feel. Um, first of all, get the technical part out of the way. So just bear with me. And we'll make the screen big. And Rob, I'm sure you'll tell me if uh, there's any problems with the screen, but the one I have here is hopefully what everybody else can see, the lead screen. That's working um, well. Jolly good, thank you. Um, so just actually, I've got uh, something in the way. I'm just going to shift it out of the way so I can actually see my slides fully. So I, I guess before we start, I'll just give you a little bit of background because I think it's quite important to demonstrate the passion I have for this. A little bit like... Rob, I'm actually um, able to retire from my full-time job now, actually a couple of weeks ago, but I'm determined to keep going because I actually love doing it. I've, uh, I've got a passion for helping people um, and I want to use the knowledge I've built up over the last 25 years in driver awareness training, started with the young learner drivers and that's, I found that very prescriptive, um, trying to get people through a test. Uh, but then fairly quickly, I switched to dealing with um, experienced drivers, normally mainly business drivers. And the thing I liked about that is you were challenged. You couldn't just say what you'd been taught, pass that on. You were challenged. You were asked, asked all awkward questions. And that make, made me um, really look into why I'm telling people this and how to go about it. Um, at the same time, I had to improve my own driving. So I started to really understand driving much more and when I'd done that for a few years uh, 14 years ago now actually I moved into Hampshire County Council and since then I've been dealing more with the uh, older older group uh, as well as carrying on with the business drivers to a degree but mainly the older group and again that's become my passion so I've really enjoyed doing it um, the webinar today it says are you driving whilst impaired well I'm going to put a uh, a thought to you, I guess, is is the best way, and to to sort of describe that. And I'm going to treat you as I think we have around about 100 people. I can't see any of you, so I don't know who's there. I'm going to treat you as, for the purposes of this presentation, as average drivers. You know, sort of the vast majority of drivers we see out there. Um, I guess because you've seen fit to come and listen to this, um, that could put you in a, a, a sort of slightly above average in terms of your willingness to, you know, be safe on the roads. Um, but for the sake of this, uh, I'm talking to average drivers. And the message I'm going to try and get across is that my belief is that for around about 75% of the time on average, our driving is impaired. So we're driving impaired and therefore not quite as safe as we, as we could be. An overview of what we're doing, if we're going to talk about impaired driving, we need to understand what is a, an acceptable good driving standard. 
Um, I will talk and try and justify what I've just said about what do we mean by impaired driving. Um, it's often we often think a bit about impaired driving as being impaired due to having too many drinks, for example, or, or drugs. Um, but there's a lot more that can impair you, uh, which we'll look into. Um, what can I do to avoid being prepared, uh, impaired? So going go to suggest a few things which will help with that. And then probably my favourite part, to be honest, and I hope you give me some, give us some challenging questions at the end. Very, very happy to uh, answer any questions afterwards. So what makes a good driver? I'll just put a sort of schematic thing up here. If you look at the top level, knowledge, control, observation and communication, that's really the basics we need for passing um, a basic driving test. But passing a basic driving test does not make us what I would think of as a good driver, of course. It just means we've demonstrated we've got the control. We've demonstrated adequate observation and communication. And we've demonstrated, certainly these days, for the last 30 or so years, they've had to pass a knowledge test uh, before the practical test. So they've demonstrated that they have the knowledge. So most people will have a basic level of this, uh, an acceptable level of this. And of course, as time goes on, we start to get a little bit lazy with the control sometimes. We maybe enter corners a little bit quicker than we should have done. Our observation, we may rush that. Um, and our communications, we may be a bit lazy at, for example, signaling. <clears throat> if we move down to the next line, anticipation and planning and awareness, these are the things which come in after we've had a little, little bit, bit of experience, you know, where something's nearly gone wrong. Um, we, we Hopefully we learn from that. And then next time we get a similar situation, we, we, we will anticipate that happening and be a bit more prepared. And over the years, we build up a picture in our in our mind about likely things that can happen um, and be ready for that. Um, and for this, we need to uh, put a driving plan into action. We need to plan our driving, even as far as when we drive, um, you know, which route we're going to take, which lowers the risk. So planning definitely comes in. We learn to plan more. And we should become more aware because as we get experience, but it doesn't always work like that. One of the reasons it doesn't always work like that is this big thing at the bottom, which is probably in a nutshell will explain why I mentioned 75% of the time we're driving impaired. They actually did some research at the um, transport research laboratories uh, many years ago now um, about what, how much the average driver concentrates on the driving task, if you like. And it was a frightening figure, actually. They found that on average, people concentrate for 25% of the time. And that's on average. That doesn't mean if you're driving all of your driving on a, um, on a very familiar road you've done many times before that you'll even be concentrating that much. Um, and of course, if you're driving through central London, you've not really been there much, uh, you're probably concentrating 100% of the time. But the average is 25%. And that is something which, um, which we, we need to increase. And that is the key thing which will go throughout this presentation. To become a really good driver, we need to use that concentration to manage the space around the vehicle and the time we have to react to situations. And in other words, we have to have safety margins so that uh, reactions don't become emergency reactions, they, they become well-planned actions. And of course, nearly everyone's a good driver. Well, if you ask them, uh, we've done, men, done polls on this many times, and the vast majority of people rate themselves as better, of, better than average. Um, and of course, that doesn't really work, uh, but it is explainable. Um, but if most people are better than average, why are apparently more than 90% of all collisions down to human error? And therefore, all of those collisions are presumably avoidable if, if somebody's made an error. Note that we also um, use the word collisions rather than accidents, because accidents uh, really has a connotation of um, 
one of those things, you know, there was no um, avoid in it. It's just happened. Whereas a collision is more somebody's fault. Somebody's done something, um, sorry, to make that uh, collision happen. So could it be that our driving skills and awareness are impaired for most of the time, which is why we have these collisions? With um, concentration normally comes because of complacency. If we've driven for several years, particularly on these uh, very familiar roads around our home, driving becomes actually quite easy. We use long learned habits. We use muscle memory. So, for example, we get in the car on our driveway or just outside our house. The, uh, the, sort of the gears, the brake, the pressure on the accelerator, the pressure on the brake, the clutch, the steering. We don't really need to think about that. We just do it without thinking. We do it automatically. Um, so as driving becomes very easy, what happens is, of course, we want to fill that time. We're not being tasked. So we can either when we're, we, you know, when we're, when we're bored, if you like, we can either go to sleep, which obviously doesn't happen when we're driving, which shouldn't do, um, or we can do other things. We can multitask. We can think about what we're having for dinner, what we're going to get at the shops, what we're going to talk about at the meeting, et cetera. So it becomes easy and therefore we don't concentrate. When it becomes obviously more complicated, and I don't know if any of you have been driving round, uh, driven round the magic roundabout in uh, Swindon, I think it is, um, is actually, when you've done that, it's actually fairly straightforward and, and makes sense. But of course, if you come to something like this um, in the distance, your conscious brain comes into uh, play and it has to really concentrate to get you around there safely. The problem, of course, is, you know, these type of things you're normally warned about. You know they're coming up. You see the signboard. It becomes more difficult gradually. But what if something happens more, something complicated happens more suddenly, such as a car door swinging open from a parked vehicle or a child running out from behind a, a bus or something? If we're not concentrating, we may not have seen the clues that that was going to happen. And we're going to react a little bit slower. And I'm sure most people will recognize autopilot. Um, and uh, where we've driven for the last 20 minutes or so, and we don't remember a thing about that journey. And we would have reacted, I'm sure, if a child had run out in front of us. But the key thing is we'd be a little bit slower reacting. And even more important, as we're going to talk about shortly, we wouldn't have seen the clue that that child may run out and we wouldn't be able to anticipate it. So how can I really become a good driver? Very simple, really. It's getting those concentration levels up as high as possible. Um, I do remember um, I had to do my advanced tests when I started dealing with uh, business drivers, because obviously a lot of them are advanced drivers. And I used to recognize autopilot um, for the years after that first advanced test. I got to a level where I just basically never had autopilot. I was concentrating most of the time. I will say that recently it's easing off a little bit. I'm finding it's much more difficult to concentrate, but it's really important to keep those high. Improve your, uh, your anticipation. We'll have a look at that and improve your safety margins, which is an interesting one, particularly when we talk about following distances. Um, but we'll have a look at that. And also improve knowledge and judgment. Um, you know, people have different uh, ideas about uh, stopping distances, etc. So we'll have a look at that as well. Now, anybody that has followed the uh, any advanced driving lessons may well have come across this book, Roadcraft. It's the Please Driver's Handbook. But I think the... Um, the advanced uh, driving tests tend to base their standards on this. And it is an excellent book if you're interested in having a look at one. Um, I've got an old copy here and I'm just going to, I've just marked up a couple of free examples. There's one here about how attitudes and emotions impair brain processing, which is sort of partly about what we're going to talk about today. 
And the other one, I mean, there's so many bits and pieces in here. It's developing skill at positioning your vehicle. And all these things can actually, can actually help you stay safe out on the roads if you have that interest. Now, I'm just going to have a quick glass of water because there's a lot of talking for me to do here. Um, this picture, how to improve concentration by reading the road. I'm sure you've heard about this before, and I'm sure many people actually know about this to a great degree. But think about it in front of the vehicle. There's various zones of vision. The furthest point you can see is an information zone, and that's where you can pick up important information about what may be happening in perhaps 10 seconds time, for example. Not much you can do about that, but you just log it in your mind so that that may um, complete the picture of what you're going to face when you get there. And it saves some people talk about um, there are too many signs on the road. They all come at once. But if you've picked out what you can from the information zone, when you get nearer, you'll be able to focus on other stuff. And then it's difficult to see that middle one, but it's action zone, that one. So this is where there is. Uh, a real hazard where you've got to deal with it. It may be a potential hazard, but you still have to deal with it as if it's going to happen, if there's a good likelihood. And for anybody that's not sure, the, um, the, the MSPSL there is a term that driving instructors use, actually. It's mirror, signal, position, speed, and look. And that's similar to the... Um, the the uh, structure of driving, the approach to driving that roadcraft uses, um, they they actually have uh, an observation, uh, continuous observation through the process, and then getting the speed, position, gear correct, and then dealing with a hazard, and then getting back up to speed again. So it's all very similar. It's just different different terms. They call it the system of car control, I believe. And that as we get nearer to the vehicle, we, we find our eyes are sort of moving um, as so we're scanning far, middle and near. Check what's behind as well, I mentioned. But the eyes need to move side to side as well to sweep the whole area. And of course, as it gets nearer the car, we we need more eye movement because it's closer to do that. So the danger area is where basically we need to take action. And the problem comes is if you first notice the, the um, hazard when it's approaching that danger zone because you haven't got time to plan properly. How to improve anticipation? We can talk about observation links on the road. So if you're concentrating fully, there should be no such thing as a, a, an empty road ahead of you. It may seem quiet, but there's always potential for something to go wrong. So the picture on the right, of course, um, we're driving on the wrong side of the road because of that parked vehicle on the left. And there is no give way markings on the junction to that to our right. What we can't see at the moment is because the blue car's hiding there is there's a road opposite that junction. So the, the vehicle driving down that junction may well see it as a crossroads and their priority. And if we're not thinking the same, uh, not ready for that, there may well be a collision there. Um, so we have to think as to ourselves as we approach that. What if a car comes out in front of us there? Are we able to cope with it? We can look under, through and over the parked vehicles to see if there's any activity. The vehicle in front on the right, for example, you'll see feet, uh, possibly if there's a small child or maybe a cat or something about to run out. We might see brake lights just go off, which... We can then ask what if the door flings open or they drive off just as we're about to go past them. And there might be reversing lights, for example, on one of the cars on the driveway. And of course, as you'll be well aware, we can't guarantee they, uh, they've seen us. So we're looking for eye contact and we ask ourselves again, what if they carry on? What will I do? And on the previous slide, we mentioned as soon as you see this potential you need to check what's behind you, because if you're being followed by a large vehicle quite close, <clears throat> you need to slow the whole thing down a little bit so that there's no uh, sudden braking or steering, because then you'll obviously have that large vehicle in the back of you. So it's 
what's going on ahead what if that happens what have i got to deal with effectively excuse me taking in information uh the familiar one for driving uh, trainers if you like uh, when the dustbins are out there's a dust cart about or operatives just around the corner um so that can come in handy it's another little observation link sometimes and the one i've had experience about and like to talk about is the bus stop <clears throat> um there's a number of people at the bus stop they seem to be looking down the road a little bit uh maybe one may be looking at their wristwatch so you sort of can guess that the bus is due. And now on a wide road, a straight road, it doesn't make much difference, that information. But if you're in the countryside on a much narrower road in the country village, that's really important to know about because some of the corners are, you know, with a bus coming towards you, a little bit too uh, narrow to pass by. So you need to be, what if that bus, you know it's going to turn up or probably going to turn up in the next 10 minutes or so so um there's a likelihood so you're ready for it if you're not concentrating you can't be ready for any of these things how to improve your safety margins now um, manage the space around the vehicle well first of all we'll talk about following distances in a moment because that's always a tricky subject in some ways for various reasons um, but managing the space around the vehicle the white car in the middle lane there is in a bit, bit of a sandwich. Um, if the white van in lane one on the left, you can see the car in the uh, car in front of that is braking. So if the white van decides to nip round that car into the middle lane, the centre lane, lane two, um, it may be that the white car in, in the middle lane there is in the blind spot of that van and many many drivers don't check their blind spot you know that little shoulder check they just check in the door mirrors so the position of that car is a little bit vulnerable if it stays there for too long rather than goes past or holds back um, it's not good management of space equally they've got themselves into a position if that does happen their escape route is blocked by a car in lane three so it's always best to play the diagonal rule, um, as we call it in this type of situation, where you don't have three abreast, you you stagger it. So if there's a vehicle like a van or a lorry, particularly um, a foreign lorry whose driver will be on the left hand side and maybe have bigger blind spots, depending on their mirrors, how they're set up. Um, you just you hold back until you can clear uh, the space and then you go past them. Um, if it's safe, of course. But what you don't want to do is trapped, be trapped in that situation. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of the recommendation for safe following distance. It is a minimum. If the weather's not too good, you should be using more than this. But the familiar rule of only a, two, only a fall breaks a two-second rule. Uh, when the, um, the vehicle in front goes under that bridge, you can possibly see in the distance you can say only a fall breaks the two second rule and you shouldn't get there before that uh, two seconds is up. That gives you a minimum safe following distance. Now, of course, what people normally say for this is if I leave that sort of gap, somebody will always fill it. Um, and in some circumstances, I have sympathy with that in terms of queuing to come off a motorway or filter into one lane where the traffic's moving uh, rather slowly. But on a fast flowing motorway, it is um, it's an argument which uh, doesn't seem to make sense to me, <clears throat> given what can happen if we don't leave that type of gap. I once did a little experiment um, driving for 20 minutes along a busy motorway, a bit like this one, but perhaps maybe not quite such a bunch of cars but or vehicles. And I counted the number of times I left this nice two second gap. I counted the times that anybody filled it and it was not particularly high, it's fairly low in fact. I also counted the times that I filled somebody else's gap because I needed to overtake. And that was higher. And of course, if there's a two second gap or more, it doesn't really affect anybody. You don't have to hit the brakes. Um, 
and motorways and dual carriageways work through lane changing. When the gaps are small, like we got on the left there, it becomes much more dangerous anyway. So it's worth trying if you don't do this and, and you do think somebody's going to fill the gap, just try and get into the habit of leaving this nice uh, gap, um, particularly behind vans and lorries where you can't see what's happening in the head and do this, you know, far, uh, middle, um, near uh, vision zones that we talked about. Use good accelerator sense. And I mentioned earlier that uh, it's like muscle memory, the way we use the accelerator. We have a technique of pressing it. And as long as there's a clear bit of road in front of us, we tend to just press it and then come off it onto the brake when there's something which holds us up. But acceleration sense, if um, I'm sure many of you use this, but if you're not sure, is about looking at a clear bit of road, looking at what's further down that road, and then deciding how hard it's worth pressing the accelerator. So in other words, not worth accelerating harshly if there's a blockage a little bit down the road, you just press it much more softly and control your speed of approach. Good for fuel economy as well, because it saves you using the brakes so uh, fiercely and dropping too much speed. Um, I use early and progressive braking. You know, if we're following somebody, particularly if we're going a bit close, what we can't deal with very well is somebody that suddenly sees a problem in front of them, hits the brake lights, brake lights come on, and the vehicle slows very quickly. Whereas what we should be doing is looking down the road. If we see a problem, particularly if our vehicle's following, we show them our brake lights and we just gently, gently increase that braking over a, a period of road. Whilst managing the situation, obviously, if you go overboard, it can cause problems behind, but you can manage that whole situation. Now, improving knowledge and judgment. Um, what I'm talking about here, or some of the things I'm talking about, is stability and grip. I'm not sure whether too many um, younger drivers, when they pass their uh, driving tests, um, some do, but not many learn too much about this. They learn to get in the car, steer it around corners, and they don't really think about the fact that uh, always that there are four wheels. We're relying on four bits of rubber, um, roughly the size of a human hand print, um, keeping us on the road. And if that loses grip, then we lose control and the collision often happens. So the best uh, situation for stability is... Um, equal weight on all of those four wheels, clearly. So we got all four wheels, equal, equal weight on the road, equal grip on the road. But when we corner, like that vehicle's doing to the right, you can see in the picture that the weight is shifted largely to the left-hand side. So most of the weight is being taken on those two left-hand wheels. Now where people go wrong and why one of the most, um, uh, catastrophic if you like type of collisions for younger drivers particularly is they end up uh, it's normally at night with distractions in the car with uh, um, passengers they end up coming into a, a, a corner too quickly and then they hit the brakes when they realize they started to steer and uh, and need to brake to slow it down but of course what that does is not only sends the um the weight to the left it sends it to the front as well. You can feel all the weight coming to the front when you brake. So you've got a, roughly a ton of vehicle being held on the road by um, one piece of rubber, mainly uh, the size of a handprint. And of course, it doesn't always work. Uh, and so what happens is the vehicle loses grip and comes off the road and, um, and unfortunately hits a tree, which doesn't absorb any of the energy. All the energy goes into the crash. And many, many young drivers over the years have been killed, unfortunately, with that type of accident and collision. So we have to understand a bit more to be uh, call ourselves really good drivers. Read in the corner. There are ways in uh, the book Roadcraft, and often many trainers use this, there are ways of judging what speed to come into a corner, which I won't go into now, but happy to answer that later on if anybody wants to know a bit more. And stopping distances, again, excuse me. Um, how, how do we judge a safe speed? Um, 
to judge a safe speed, we need to know what the stopping distance is, stopping distance is for our vehicles. So heavier vehicles will take longer to stop. But I think the problem I've found, and it seems to be the case, that the vast majority of drivers don't really understand how long it's going to take them to stop. Or certainly complacency can come in a little bit. Um, if we look at the highway code, the stop and distances in there have been the same for many, many years as cars have improved, but they're still very valid, uh, according to uh, research we've done, reports of collisions when they measure the uh, skid marks, etc. They still seem very valid, which is why uh, they don't change. Um, so with stop and distance, we'll, we will have a look at that in a little bit more in a minute. And ABS and the technology in the car. So I'm sure you all know, or most of you know, that ABS is anti-lock braking system. Nearly, well, every car has that now, I think. Uh, some of the older ones don't, but pretty much every car does now. Um, but just because we've got ABS doesn't necessarily mean we can stop any quicker than without it. It helps us on uh, on wet roads a little bit because it stops the wheels from um, losing grip. It momentarily takes the brakes off and on very, very quickly. Um, but well, I came across a situation where a bad collision happened uh, several years ago now. <clears throat> and after this bad collision, the owner of the vehicle who was driving took it back to the garage and said, the brakes aren't working because when I tried to ha hit the brakes in an emergency, the brake pedal was juddering at my foot, so I had to take it off. I thought it was falling apart. And of course, that's what ABS should do. And these days, most people know that, but if you've never experienced it before, really important to have that little bit of knowledge. It does fit judders under your foot, and you should keep your foot on to enable the vehicle to stop. The advantage of ABS, you can brake heavily and steer at the same time without it skidding out of control. Uh, ESP and ESC, very uh, quickly, uh, it's about electronic stabilization programming. That means if you're following a vehicle along a dual carriageway, for example, a low loader, let's say, and the box falls off the back, you're going to steer quickly to one way or the other, let's say to the right, to avoid this box bouncing, bouncing towards you. And without any technology, the chances are you will oversteer, the back will swing round and, and you'll pivot in, in, go around in a circle. Highly dangerous at sort of 70 odd miles an hour on the motorway or dual carriageway. Whereas what this technology does is it senses grip on all four wheels independently and it either brakes or accelerates the wheels to enable you to steer around. Um, so very good piece of technology. Most, certainly the bigger cars, and I think a lot of the smaller ones have got that um, these days. I talked about stopping distances and I said, I, I said I'd mention it a little bit more. Um, with, if we talk about speed, first of all, if everybody had perfect judgment, in my view, of stopping distances, how long it's going to take and perfect anticipation, we wouldn't need speed limits. Um, the reason speed limits uh, are there is because one, people generally don't have that full awareness of what it takes to stop the overestimate, they get complacent and they form habits. And the habits tend to be based on what they've learned, perhaps when they were sitting in their parents or carers' uh, car when they were younger, what they see other people do, and they go with the flow. But the 30 mile an hour, for example, speed limits are there for a good reason. And you can drive um, for miles along a straight 30 mile an hour road at 35, and you probably would get away with it. But if that's your habit, only needs one pedestrian, one child to step out in your whole life of driving, and you will be doing 35 miles an hour and you will likely kill that child. Whereas if you're doing 30, there's a bigger chance that they may survive. The picture shows there just a few miles an hour, a couple of miles an hour difference between missing and hitting the pedestrian. Um, I'm gonna have just now, I want you to have a look at this um, typical rural road, fairly typical anyway. Um, sweeping right-hand bend, the hedges are slightly overgrown or not too bad, but can't really see what's coming. 
Uh, we've got a couple of junctions on the left. Um, my argument on this one is, is very difficult to see on that picture, but my suggestion is at 30 miles an hour here, and it's a national speed limit piece of road, I believe, and that's a maximum. It's not a it's not a target, of course. And then 30 miles an hour here would be too high. And I better explain that if anybody's thinking, well, I think 20 at this point is much more realistic. So we talked about what if anticipation. So what if there's a large delivery van? A bit late for a, um, a delivery, got a bit behind, pushing the speed just a little bit, nothing too excessive, but just a little bit, just about to appear around the bend, that right-hand bend there coming towards us. Um, possibly the road's wide enough to go past if we're doing 30 miles an hour and they're good position, although that can't be guaranteed. But what if at exactly the same time they get to us, a vehicle approaches from the left at one of those junctions? It immediately means we haven't got any clearance safety margins to our left. It immediately means we're going to... Um, likely to come into a head-to-head -head confrontation with that that van so if we take on to the next picture now and if that red line there is um roughly the halfway point to what we see maybe it's a little bit further but what the judgment should be here is that if you're doing 30 miles an hour by the time you get to that red line, unless you're anticipating and thinking what if, and your foot's almost ready to pounce on the brake, under normal circumstances, when you get to that red line at 30 miles an hour, you will still be doing 30 miles an hour. Because at that speed, the thinking distance for somebody that reacts relatively quickly is about two and a half car lengths, three car lengths maybe. And you can see if you're slightly distracted, you're on autopilot it may be longer so there's no way you would stop in time before you uh, come face to face with a with the white van so if we bring it down to say 20 or maybe even lower in some circumstances just for that period of that really difficult bit of road we're much more likely uh, to avoid any collisions if those two events however unlikely they are one day they may well happen so it's definitely worth thinking about on those bits, keeping the speed nice and low and anticipating what if that van comes flying around the corner. Um, positioning, I mentioned it earlier when we looked at roadcraft. Um, positioning, um, if you position well to the left, approaching the right-hand bend, you've got a better view around the corner. You open up your um, zone of vision and the approaching vehicle sees you earlier. But of course, here we can't afford to do that because of the danger of a car sticking their nose out at these junctions. So therefore, we have to deal with it on speed reduction. Uh, the vehicle at the top there, where the van would be coming from, the, in red in this case, um, if they are coming fairly wide along the corner, we're going to see them earlier. But you can see the different, the different, the difference, the different position makes it may be not much on the road but that's those are crucial split seconds um the earlier we can see them the better we are if that vehicle that red vehicle the van coming around the corner is sticking to the left hand side of course we're going to see them much later and have very little time uh, indeed so we've talked about concentration now um but even if we're concentrating we can still be impaired um, in fact, what you tend to get is um, outside schools, um, in perhaps icy weather, um, these type of places where you would expect a collision possibly to happen, more risk of a collision, doesn't necessarily follow like that. And the reason is because the concentration is much higher. Uh, excuse me for the I once stood in Winchester city centre and um, watched the traffic lights down by the station there, if anybody knows them. Got five different legs, there's vehicles coming from all ways and the traffic lights were broken. And generally the drivers were concentrating fully, 
uh, and flowing through that junction nicely without any queue in or anything and no accidents and just two people wrecked it for everybody else one was the impatient person trying to get through it making everybody else hit the brakes and the other one was the person who was being a bit too tentative and, and not taking the opportunity to flow through it even though it was safe so the vast majority of drivers when they concentrate are very good the problem is lack of concentration you can't really be a good driver so these things happen when we're even when we're concentration you know if we get fatigued on the road we're going to be concentrating because we know we're getting fatigued if we're feeling stressed we're going to be concentration we don't tend to go into autopilot when we're stressed we may have other stuff on our mind and get distracted but we don't necessarily go into autopilot attitude and perception we'll have a look at and drink drugs um, even if we're concentrating uh, these are going to impair our decision making and our concentration skills and the way we process information um, I was talking to someone just before this webinar actually um, who uh, by all accounts uh, somebody who was just about 80 years of old uh, of age um, by all accounts was driving quite safely and drove up to London to see friends every now and again and without any problems particularly but the reason for the conversation was the fact that the last two times she'd been up she got caught and fined for driving in the bus lane by mistake that happened two times running and one of the things I said to her was even though you're a really good driver by all accounts age for every everybody all of us affects the way we process information affects the speed at which we can make decisions and take in information it's very easy to get information overload so you could say even the aging effect can impair our driving um, certainly medical conditions can poor eyesight can um, so what most people are very sensible about doing is compensating for that and um, staying on roads they you know can cope with where you haven't got quite as much information coming in so with fatigue recognizing the early signs of tiredness and stop driving until you are refreshed um, you can put the uh, blower on get uh, cold air in your face open the window put the music up but that is only just the first aid to get you by the next minute or two probably uh, you do need to stop as soon as it's safe and, and get fresh air strong cups of coffee etc and then aim to get where you're going um, with as many stops as you need high high um, danger high risk uh, if you're fatigued when you're driving of course now this is an interesting little video i'm just gonna save my voice by playing through the yellow circle is identifying the vision sweep of this driver who is not tired at the beginning of the vid video but it's just demonstrating what happens to your vision as you become fatigued we talked about the information zone looking in the far distance earlier and you'll find as you get tired it's much more difficult to to lift your eyes up to that uh, to pick up information in that zone you're just more worried in what's right in front of you so when the red circles come in these are hazards we haven't yet spotted and you see at the beginning there are no red circles but as time goes on as this driver gets for tired uh, gets fatigued there are more red circles come in. You'll see what I mean, hopefully. If it's been out, oh, should play. I think I have to press a different button. Yeah. So you can see the eyes sweeping, looking at all the information we need it. And then in a minute, we'll just go to the left door mirror as well, because it's always handy to now and again keep an eye on anything coming down the left hand side, even on if there is a hard shoulder. And then as time goes on, the, the movement of the eyes tends to slow a little bit and we catch things a little bit later that hazard appeared before we'd looked at it we hadn't been scanning we haven't yet looked at the car come up on our left hand side which was visible in the door mirror because we're focusing on that we haven't seen the lorry behind us which is a very important piece of information in terms of our planning and you can see the whole eye movement start to slow down. So it becomes in this particular scenario here where there's a lot going on, 
much more taxing. And this is where you know um, the next service station is where you want to be stopping or, or leave the motorway and have a break. And you can see now the scanning is just really mainly focused in on the head. Uh, there's a car coming up on the right. You'll see in the door mirror. We don't see it until it's almost about to come in front of us. And then we go over to it. So it's a, a great video in many ways to actually demonstrate um, one of the signs of particularly on these boring motorways. If they're boring, but um, on these motorways, which sometimes can go quiet and then things can start to happen. Um, so it just demonstrates the effect of tiredness to some degree. Stress. Uh, we all get stressed. Um, there may be when we go out driving, we're already stressed because we have had an argument at work or at home. Uh, we may have got late for our appointment, so we've started off very stressed. But stress is impairment, really, because when we're stressed, the muscles around our shoulders can go tight. Our neck muscles go tight. We tense up at the steering wheel. We can even start to feel hot. Um, depending on how stressed we are. And what I was told once, and it makes perfect sense, is when our muscles around our neck get tight, it restricts the oxygen flow to our brain. So we start making irrational decisions, things we would not normally do. We don't judge safety, have same attitude to safety because we've got to get there. So sit back in your seat, listen, loosen the shoulders, take deep breaths, and just try and de-stress thinking about getting home safely because you don't get a second chance if something goes wrong. And of course, it may not be us that's getting stressed. It may be something we've innocently, in the in the eyes of another driver, done wrong. Or even if we haven't, if their perception is we've cut them up or something. Um, so all was well, um, well worth uh, diffusing any potential road rage situations because road rage is the ultimate stress and. It's when people lose self-control completely, and that can become highly dangerous, not only for them, but other people on the road. It's always best just to diffuse it a nice, polite wave if you've um, made a mistake, or even if you don't think you have, and they're obviously upset. Uh, easy to say, I know, but uh, that would be the advice there. Never make a rush decision. Now, we're going to have a look at this in a moment with another video. Um, but the brain plays tricks on us. I'm going to talk about that. So never make a rush decision because it won't necessarily be a safe one. I'm going to play this video and then we'll play it a second time. So have a look. If it works, sorry. Oh. Sorry about this. Hmm. No, got that up. Right, let's try again. Yes. Oh. <laughs> clearly pressing something wrong somewhere yeah there we go you can see my nice neat uh blanketing out of the company name on that vehicle to be polite but um let me just play that again because of the uh just got that there we go so you can see that vehicle slid out nicely there turns out perfectly safely but the point being that was never safe um in certain circumstances so this is where we're going to go back again for a third time. Now, I don't know if you can see the pointer here, but the junction, as you have seen, is up here somewhere. You've got a view through the trees. Now, there are different types of junctions. There are closed junctions and open junctions or a variety, you know, somewhere between that. A very closed junction would be like the one I was uh, recently, at uh, the weekend actually, in Guernsey. And um, some of the brick walls on there, you know, you have to be out in the road before you can see what's coming. So it's very, very closed. Um, with those ones, you have to get to the giveaway point and then you have to look a minimum of right, left, right again. About one second each time gives your brain a chance to in your eyes a chance to catch anything that might be there. Um, if you still can't see at the giveaway line, then you should just ease forward a touch stop and do the same again um, but of course not all junctions are like that or not that many are that bad um, a lot of them are more open the, the, uh, the extreme example of that is an approach to some of these big roundabouts where we've got good views from a bit further back in fact sometimes they actually put observation barriers to slow people down 
um, to get them to have a better look. But this this junction coming up on the left here is a slightly open junction. So with the view through the trees there, when we first see the van, you can do some of that observation, one, two, three, when you're moving. But what you can't do or shouldn't do is come out over the white line before you've spent three seconds looking. So let's just run it forward. And when we first see the driver of that van, we count how many seconds he's had a look at the situation. So there, one. So he's out within one second, effectively. There. Um, whoops, we're trying to stop this now. Um, so with that one, that driver is going to miss potentially a motorbike coming along, a cyclist. Not because he, he may be a young driver, he's got really good eyesight, but his brain will play tricks on him. He thinks he's seen the clear road and he will miss something. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. So before we do that, I just want to talk about attitude and perception. You could have two very similar drivers, very good drivers maybe, but they may have different ideas about the same situation. And one of the most common things is roundabout. Um, if one driver believes due to what they think is local knowledge that the middle lane is, is, is the correct lane for maybe, I don't know, the third exit, depending on how many exits there are, and the other driver thinks that maybe the, uh, the third lane, if there is, yeah, there is one there, is, is the correct lane. So they have different ideas. Uh, when they're coming to leave the roundabout, um, they both think they're in the right. And, and sometimes, particularly when stress comes in with some drivers, they will insist of their right of passage, if you like, their right of way. Um, and that's where the accidents, collisions happen. So you have to be a little bit um, open to other people might having a different perception of you. Um, the HGVs, this is a local, um, uh, sorry, a recent um, uh, National Highways poster just to bring awareness of uh, HGV blind spots. And it may be one driver totally understands um, that type of thing because they've maybe driven a lorry or they've seen posters like this and whereas the other driver is completely unaware and will stay in that blind spot like we talked about earlier. Um, but the big one there for perception, something recently which has happened to change the highway code. I've done um, many uh, presentations actually over the last year on that. And um, with some people, they thought the changes of a highway code was a legal requirement. You had to stop. Whereas what it actually is, is guidance but you should be ready to give way to a pedestrian who's likely to cross it doesn't mean you should stop every time because often pedestrians don't cross and sometimes you can stop and be a bit more dangerous so it's the perception and the attitude to the whole scenario knowing what it says in the highway code and how to deal with it as long as you deal with it safely with care and attention you can't go too far wrong and of course that doesn't not everybody um, follows that so you get the problems right we're nearly there now so just uh, to finish really how our brain processes information we take information largely through sight hearing smell and touch also help uh, in the extreme with driving particularly hearing uh, hearing the indicators blinking away we've forgotten to cancel them opening the window to hear at these closed junctions whether there's any traffic coming etc but sight is the main one there. Um, this little video here gives you an idea what our brain does. It picks up, uh, I've done it again, no, I haven't. Um, it picks up bits of information from what's ahead and it builds a picture. But it's not perfect. It, the brain fills in any gaps. So you'll see as it ends here, there are still little gaps there. And the brain, especially if we haven't looked for long enough, the brain will make sense of the picture and tell us what's there. And that's where we can easily miss a, um, a cyclist, pedestrian, et cetera, something which is not too easy to see. I don't know if you've seen this, but just to uh, uh, sort of show you how seeing is not believing, uh, A and B, the two squares on the right-hand side, are the same colour. Now, I know they're the same colour because I've checked it out, and I'm going to show you how I've checked it out on the next slide. And my brain cannot make them the same colour. And it's because it's what we're expecting to see. 
all I've done there is paint over the rest of that picture and enlarged it a little bit. And you can see from that, that's exactly the same picture. They are indeed pretty much the same color. There are six Fs in this sentence. Now, if you've seen this before, you may just be good at proofreading, et cetera, you'll, you'll quite possibly find them, but the majority of people will struggle to see all six, however long I give you. Um, and of course, the missing, one, the missing ones are the three ofs. So you've got finished file, scientific on the top two line, uh, lines, and then you've got two ofs on the second line, one of on the bottom line. Those ofs, uh, our brain doesn't need to take them in, they're joining words, it doesn't really need to make sense of that. But the trouble is those ofs could be, if we're looking for cars and vans, those ofs could be the motorcyclist if we don't scan the road properly. And the words look but didn't see, often junction accidents happen when there's a perfectly good view, but the driver just didn't see. And you get these horrendous accidents where it's too late to go back. Impairment due to drink and drugs. Um, I just obviously everybody be well aware of this, but um, should never really, well, we should never definitely drink alcohol, take drug, any drugs, and drive uh, if possible. I'll say if possible, I'll explain that in a minute. But particularly with drinks, if you've been out drinking to celebrate a birthday the night before and you've uh, had, say, Quite easy to have 10 units of alcohol if you know a few with the strength of some of the wine and the beer and the um, spirits um quite easy to have 10 units that means you're going to be about it's an hour per unit so you're going to be about 10 hours later before you can even think about driving again so you can't get up next day if you finished at midnight and go to work at seven you'd be still affected you're still impaired now, just want to cover this. I know time's going on now, but um, just it's important to cover this. It's illegal, it's illegal in England, Scotland and Wales to drive with legal drugs in your body if it impairs your driving. Now, measurement of impairment is a tricky subject, but that's the law. It's an, it's an offence to drive if you have over the specified limit of certain drugs. And I'll show you those certain drugs as prescription drugs in your in your blood and you if you have not been prescribed them so that's the list of the list they give these drugs if you haven't been prescribed those then it's determined by the limit that's in your body in your system if a, if you're above that limit you could be driving illegally and therefore prosecuted if you got a prescription as long as it's not affecting uh, making you unfit to drive then you're okay as long as they've been scribe, prescribed for you so they've been prescribed and it's not making you unfit to drive you'll be okay if it is of course you're driving illegally but if you give a prescription to a husband wife and they, it's not prescribed for them all they have to do is be over a certain limit whether they're fit to drive or not it's the limit in that case so it's worth um, bearing that in mind. Summary. So we're there pretty much. Um, we talked about increasing levels of concentration, really important, avoiding complacency and avoid driving if you can, if you're impaired in any way. And I'm talking about stress, tiredness, et cetera. So we started off with a picture which was quite difficult uh, driving conditions um dazzled by the lights getting dark and we want to be able to deal with those type of things until we can drive off into the into the sunset at the end of our road to driving retirement uh, whenever that comes um we want to be safe uh, obviously until the end there we don't want to be driving impaired now i know i said that was a summary but this is just a very quick goodbye from me just to sort of demonstrate this just imagine you're driving down this road it's on the way to work or, or a friend's house you've done it many times before you can drive it on autopilot nothing's ever gone wrong and there's one video here so this is it you know you're coming along at dead on 40 maybe a little bit more and then we'll just play it again um you may not spot if you know this road the car coming in from the left now hidden 
and you may not then notice that on the right hand side there's nobody coming past so you've got an escape route and you may have been going a bit faster so it's just an example of what we talked about if you're fully aware it's an easy situation to be uh, deal with if you're not could turn into an accident a collision right that's enough for me so i'm really pleased if anybody's got any questions uh, and i will stop sharing now rob thank you very much graham fantastic very useful and very informative for us all really there just to let us be completely aware of what's going on on the roads with us and what we can look out for and how we can improve our driving so quite a few questions here so the first one, it says twice I have been told by the hospital that I'm not insured to drive my car for six weeks after leaving hospital a couple of days post surgery. So no anaesthetic left in my system. But my insurers say that I am. Um, my surgery was left on my left leg and I drove an automatic car. So according to my insurers, as I can do an emergency stop and my condition is not sometimes not something that needs to be registered and I'm insured. I believe my insurers have ignored the hospital comments. Why do hospitals, though, use this automatic command um, without any conscience of the individual circumstances? You know, is there any reason why they might do that, do you think? Yeah, I guess we can both answer that, couldn't we, Rob? Um, but certainly fitness to drive is a medical decision. Um, and if a doctor says you shouldn't drive for six weeks, then... It could be if you had an accident, um, but you could be driving illegally, even if your insurance is covering you. I think what the uh, the thing that confused me a little bit is um, the fact that the hospital said your insurance will not be covered. Um, I think it's probably more um, uh, sensible to for the for the doctors to say um, from a medical standpoint, don't drive for six weeks. Yeah. Uh, what your feelings are. Yeah, absolutely. And with insurance, the way many people get confused, sometimes they say uh, you won't be insured. I think the thing to remember that insurance, if we pay out for insurance, even if we're illegal on the road to drive like we have no license or something like that, because we've paid out and we are still paying that insurance, actually, the insurance company will stay or still pay third party insurance out. They won't cover your fully comp, but they still cover you third party. There's a legal requirement that they have to do. So you would be insured. But what I would always say is that if you were involved in a collision or there was an incident that happened and a police would did an investigation about it and they found that you'd been told by the hospital not to drive, then you could be facing a prosecution for things like dangerous driving or something like that. So I'd always err on that side of caution. It's something certainly to take up with the hospital and ask them about it. But, you know, my recommendation is if you've been told not to drive, we really should be abiding by what the um, hospitals are telling us, even if we may not agree with it. Now, um, another question someone said to me, just curious, how many advanced motorists are attending this webinar? Absolutely have no idea, but I know there's a few um, and I think it's a really useful thing for us all to think about developing our driving. You know, Graham mentioned in there that there are lots of courses and things like that out there to help and uh, brush up on your skills. And it doesn't matter just because we may be getting a bit older doesn't mean that we're not perfectly fit and capable to do those. So think about, you know, there's organizations like IAM, Road Smart, ROSPA, lots of different organizations offering you to help brush up on your skills. You know, even if it's just a review, you know, Graham, for example, through Hampshire County Council, they run their driver skill 60 plus in Hampshire. Excellent scheme, just about giving you some hints and tips to brush you up in your vehicle about being safe on the road. Always recommend something we think about with the older drivers forum is not become complacent, but seek that help and support, which you're all doing by turning up today's webinar. So don't know if you've got anything else you want to say on that, Graham. Uh, no, not really. I just, um, I, you know, we talked about what is a good driver and I think we have to get our perspectives right because I have this favourite saying, what you don't know, you don't know. Um, so you can't judge yourself as a driver until you know what being, a, for example, a police um, police class one, is it? Yeah. One driver, perhaps one of the best drivers in the world, if not the best in terms of their ability. Now, we haven't got a driver 80 miles an hour chasing a criminal, but we can still, the advanced courses still give you an idea of what they do. 
they just spend weeks on their training as yeah. you will well know from the past but yeah it is about I, getting it in perspective really. and i think the thing to remember with this is um when i was in the place i was a class one motorcyclist car class one car driver i was remember that terminology i'm using when i was in the police i was being checked every year to make sure i still fit in with that standard now i've retired now for about four or five years that doesn't mean I'm a class one anymore. I've probably picked up and still got that knowledge like Graham's talking about, the skills to help me, you know, pick up hazards early and things like that. But because I'm not being refreshed regularly, I still am not, I can't classify myself as a class one anymore. Mm. So I'd always say to yourselves, just maybe because you have done some IAM or ROSPA course in the past, don't think, well, that makes me an advanced driver. These are skills that we need to work on regularly to keep up to date with it. So that's yeah. something I'd always recommend. I think one that one of the slight problems in the past, and, and I've certainly started to look at how we can deal with this, is there's a bit of a dissociation between what normal driving is and, and some of the people that do the driver training. And if that gap's too big, people aren't going to be interested in being told they just see it out of their reach or, you know, too picky, if you like. So I think you have to have a real world approach whilst using those techniques with people um, to encourage that more. Yeah. Someone made a little comment about a, a acronym called COAST, Concentration, Observation, Antici Anticipation, Space and Time. Something actually, I'm a driver awareness trainer for an organisation called UK ROAD, and that's something that we teach within there as well. You know, we need to concentrate exactly as Graham said. We need, if we concentrate, we can observe the hazards, and if we can observe the hazards, we can anticipate what's going to happen next, prepare ourselves for that, and if then if we give ourselves plenty of space, we can react to that, and always the key ingredient I had with my driving courses is that time to react always give ourselves plenty of time to react so yeah great acronym ghost something we have all the way around the uk now um someone's put on a recent senior driver's assessment i was criticized for overuse of the horn is it enough just to be ready for the hazard without backing up with a horn yeah that's really interesting question because um i think things have changed over the years um i remember my father-in-law when he was around I was sitting with him one day and there was some um people walking towards a side road he was going to turn into and <clears throat> well before the highway code had changed what it is now and he thought well they're not going to walk in front of me blasted the horn and went round. and I think that was more of a done thing in those days from what I understood from him anyway um the problem with use overuse of the horn even as a warning is it stresses other people in terms of annoys them and and we said early when you start annoying other motorists other drivers other road users it, it can get out of hand sometimes let's just put it that way so i think you've got to be sensible about use it if somebody if you real feel you need to tell somebody you're there but don't just use it for any situation try and you know deal with it yeah That's great you can. Um, and then safe driving, someone says, relies on concentration. Modern cars are filled with distractions. New young drivers have grown up with those touchscreen phones, and I worry that they will treat the touchscreen in the car as an extension to their beloved mobile phones and spend more time with their finger on the touchscreen rather than an eye on the windscreen. In-car technology seems to be unstoppable, but it's going to seriously undermine the concentration needed to drive safely. Bit of a statement there. Yeah. I, I would totally agree with you in this. You know, unfortunately, I'm not I, I, I growing up from the days where we used to have a little s sweep to turn the heater on and off or a little switch to turn things, the fan up and down. Now it seems to be a control systems thing. Now, just to let you know, there are offenses that the police can do you with, with that. You know, we know about the mobile phone offenses that people can have. If you even pick up your phone out of the cradle or whatever and even touch the screen now and it illuminates that even without making a call is classified as using a mobile phone. £200 fine, six points on your license. But even if you're distracted in your vehicle, so if a policeman was following you down the road and just saw you wobble, hang back a little bit, be a little bit over hesitant, they'd probably stop you and then be able to identify that maybe you were driving not in proper control of your vehicle. They might see you playing with that in-car screen. They might find you doing something distracting. That is an offence as well. So and also a lot of that fits in with what we call careless driving and dangerous driving as well, ultimately. So yeah. really important thing. Yeah, I mean, that came up the other day with recently had to trial a nissan leaf electric vehicle and it's got lots of different technology in it 
Um, and the fear was that the people driving there sort of, you know, they drive off and then they say, oh, let's just see what this button does. How does that work? And that can be very, I would advise just, you know, do it before you drive, you know, any new technology, make sure you know what you're doing because it can be very distracting. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got another one here. What's your thinking on listening to a music or podcast while driving, i.e. OK, but mute if you need to concentrate more? Yeah, that again, good question. They all are. Um, there's a secret to multitasking and driving, in my view. There's a difference between multitasking and being distracted. So sometimes we have to multitask. We have to switch windscreen wipers on um, and, and et cetera. Um, and we like to listen to the music or even the passenger. The secret for me is how I deal with it is whilst you're doing that, still be running through this far middle near behind process because it keeps you engaged with the road the danger is when you start listening to a nice tune or discussion on the radio is the eyes drop down to just in front of the bonnet and we get sucked in that's what you have to avoid so multitasking and distraction are slightly different things depending on the degree so you've got to try and if you're going to talk to a passenger, keep your eyes high and sweep. Yeah. And and to be honest, I mean, whilst I was in the police, unfortunately, I dealt with over 100 fatalities on the road. And quite a few of them was that moment's inattention. It really was that moment's inattention that just took your eyes off the road, concentrated about something else. You like Graham was saying, you know, how many of us have turned up, at a, you know, down the turned up down the shops on a regular route that we've known and suddenly got there and thought, oh, how did I get here? You know, and it's because we're thinking about other things in our lives. But most collisions happen within five mile radius from where we live. So it's so important that we keep that concentration at all times, not even on routes that we know. It, uh, now, this is a bit confusing one. I'll try and read this. Is it a good idea to use the photograph of the driver with only one hand on the wheel under stress? I was taught when learning to drive to keep both hands on the wheel, except when changing gear. Yeah, I accept that. Um I think I didn't particularly choose. I, I don't even know if that driver was driving without going back to the picture. He may have just been sitting in there to fit in with the fact, oh, I've got to drive now, you know, de-stress before you go out driving. But the fact is the safest, lowest risk is to have both hands in contact with the steering wheel at a decent position because you never know when you're going to need it. You could drive for many years with one hand largely. Many people do one hand on the gear stick and get away with it, but yeah how you recognize the difference between a good driver and a, a not quite so good driver is about the risk you're at, at your habits yeah. and the best driver is going to have both hands on the wheel so that whatever circumstances they can deal with it in my view yep grand another one any hot tips for coping with night driving especially glare from headlights and slower recovery of night vision with age now just to let you know, that's a really that's good yours. pointer. We have actually created a webinar tomorrow called Is Your Vision Roadworthy? This is particularly one that we're covering. So anybody who's watching this as a later date, it is recorded and you'll be able to watch it after tomorrow on our Older Drivers Forum website under the page webinars. So you'll be able to pick it up on there as well. Likewise, this webinar is recorded as well and will be up on our website within 24 hours as well for you to have a look at as well so we're going to lots on there now i'll give you a few hints on this anyway because i will be talking and we've got a optometrist talking about some of this tomorrow you know at the age of um 15 if we're blinded by a set of headlights it will take our sight about two seconds to come back up to being normal at the age of 65 it can take up to nine seconds for our sight to come back being normal and the main reason for that is because the rods and cones in our eyes which are muscles really predominantly take much slower to process as we get older like any muscle you know starts to wear out a little bit which is why a lot of mature motorists decide to not drive at night so one of the, some of the things you can do if you are being blinded especially by these really bright headlights these days you know when you got that bright one maybe look down to the left hand side and the white line on the road and follow that for a second keeping looking up and down but you know if it gets so bad pull in and stop at the end of the day you know it is a really a difficult thing and we talk about contrast sensitivity which is really where this eyesight issue certainly gets something as we get a as we age has an effect on us now one of the things we can do that can quite often be in 
in the summer coming up between going into a shadow or a bright area as well those sort of things so the use of sunglasses but sometimes they are if you've got those reactor glasses they may take a bit longer to correct and things like that so there's lots of things we will be talking about this tomorrow on tomorrow's webinar as well um so also we've got someone said why do they call you know advanced courses you know often like iam and things mm. like that why are they advanced surely they should be development coaching or something like that yeah and that, i think that's what I, I didn't actually say that but that was what's going through my mind you know if if that's a good standard of driving it keeps the risk low then that should be good driving it shouldn't yeah. be advanced yeah. you know we yeah. should all be aiming for that and somewhere along the line it you know it doesn't happen because of the way the system works but yeah. yeah you're right um, we should never really again be complacent should we never be complacent about our driving if we think about it you know it's very easy when we've driven from thousands and thousands of miles over our lifetime to suddenly think well i'm a good driver like we said at the start i haven't really had a collision i'm perfectly okay but you know we're all learning every day every day we're learning something new so why not keep doing that with your driving so it is a good idea to have a brush up on your skills regular eyesight tests all these different things are great ways of keeping us focused and reducing our risks on the road as well so um someone said can i just recap again about the coast acronym okay i'll give it to you i, I will put this up on the website as well um as well but it's concentration observation anticipation space and time okay coast hope for that picks it up no problems i'll put it on the when we put this up i'll put it on the bottom of the screen for people to see as well so uh, please can you recap on prescription drugs and the rules if you take your own prescription drugs or or your wife's I'm not quite sure if you're taking oh, yeah. someone else's drugs no that that yeah um that I think that comes from what I said on the on the thing um basically the law is and tell me you'll know more about this Rob but correct me but why I understand it the law is that if you prescribed a drug from that list that I showed you it doesn't matter if you're over the limit of the prescribed limit in your system providing you're fit to drive as long as you're prescribed it now if you have a prescribed drug and you think oh i'll share this with my wife my husband it's different for them because it's not prescribed for them so they if they go above that limit in their system they could be prosecuted whereas the same limit it is it's an odd one but yeah. that's pretty much it yeah so so basically there are certain drugs legal drugs that we can use when for driving which are prescribed by uh, a, a pharmacist or your GP and basically what they're saying in relation to that is if it causes you to have any form of impairment in your driving and does affect your driving then it's illegal any form of impairment however if um if someone takes a blood test from you and they see that you've got that drug in your system okay they will basically say well okay that person is using that drug legally because they prescribed that drug as part of their prescription with the GP. And as long as you abide by what your GP has set to you and they know that you're a driver, OK, some of the medication may say avoid driving. So maybe we shouldn't be driving with those as well. So that's an important thing. And a concoction of different drugs can make a difference as well. So it's always important to speak to your pharmacist just to confirm I'm taking this, this and this. Am I OK to driving? But what I'd always say if you are impaired, if you feel that your reactions are slower and you're not right with that, don't drive. And ultimately, it's your safety and others that we should be protecting. So, you know, that's the important thing really to think about. Um, another one, as I get older, the most difficult now is tar parking into tight spots. Why is that the case? Mm, that's a tr uh, tricky one, really. Um, I, we know that... Um... We know things happen to the way the brain presses information. Um, one of the things which may happen is um, a reduction in spatial awareness. Um, and it only has to be a small reduction. If you've got a small parking space with uh, very small safety margins, it doesn't take much, whether it's either a decline in the eyesight or the thinking. And it's natural. It happens to us all, you know. So I don't know exactly, but that would seem to make sense to me. 
Yeah, yeah, I think that would be the case, isn't it? Because we lose our peripheral vision a little bit, yeah. goes down as we go. So that the peripheral vision we're talking about is when something is appearing from the side of our eyes when we're looking ahead. That, instead of being just really able to look almost 90 degrees, will start to reduce. It's a natural aging process. So as Graham was saying, that may be one of the reasons. The other thing is mobility sometimes. You know, as we age, our, we have stiffness in our neck and shoulders and things, and therefore being able to move and be able to see suddenly and things like that may be reduced, which is why maybe parking in tight spots can be a bit more difficult as we age as well but there's other coping mechanisms we can do that can't we when you're going to go and park find a nice place which isn't a tight spot try and find you know somewhere that you may be able to drive forwards and go into the car parking space the other side you know drive through one into the next one be careful to make sure no one's parking in opposite you but you know maybe look at that when you're looking to park so try and find coping mechanisms for yourself when you're doing that as well so um, just one other thing I was just going to say, we did talk about during this, didn't we? In, um, um, Graham was talking about speed and reactions. And as the faster we go, our reactions sometimes, you know, are slower. Just something to bear in mind. If you travel at 80 miles an hour on a motorway, OK, which is obviously illegal. But if you travel at 80 miles an hour instead of 70 miles an hour for 30 miles, OK, you only save yourself three minutes that's all you do so you hardly save yourself any time but you actually massively increase your risk of being involved in much more serious collision because the faster you go that extra time and speed that's required the momentum increases even more as you go for it so it's just not worth even speeding because you hardly save yourself any time but massively increase your risk but also you don't won't be able to pick up those hazards as quickly as well like graham was talking about so that could be something that we're looking at as well so I think that's it for my questions today. Thank you ever, must, ever so much, everybody, for taking part in today's course. A big thank you to Graham Millwood for his wonderful presentation to you all. Uh, I think it's been really thought-provoking, giving us some lots to think about. Now, if you want to revisit again, have a visit of our website, olderdriversforum.com. Go to the webinars page, which is under the events tab, and you'll be able to see all these videos recorded, and you'll be able to watch them again as well. If you have any other further questions, then please just go through the Older Drivers Forum and you'll be able to ask us as well. If you want to know about forthcoming webinars that we're running and events that we're running with the Older Drivers Forum, then go into the front page of the Older Drivers Forum, click on the follow button and put in your email address and then we'll update you with new things going on, all that information, info interesting things that are going on. We won't be bombarding you with spam and rubbish and advertising stuff. It will only be stuff which is useful to you. So please follow our website. You'll get to hear about so much more that we're running as well. But finally, just have an explore of our website. There's lots of useful information, videos, webinars, and general things. It's a one-stop shop for signposting you to the right information that you need to carry on driving safely for longer. And that's what we're all about. So thank you very much, everybody, for taking part in today's um, webinar. Thank you to Graham and have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.